Hey crew, it's Pitt and I'm back with some more esoterica. Today we're diving back into the works of Mrs. Helena Blavatsky. This is Isis Unveiled. We are reading aloud and discussing as we go along the various points that are brought to light by the text. It's not the format for everyone, but some people seem to find enjoyment in it, so you are more than welcome to tag along as we continue our exploration. Before we begin, however, if you are unfamiliar with me, any of my unconventional beliefs, or if at any point in time I lose you in the terminology, there will be several playlists linked in the corner above, in the box below, along with the original source material, so that you can get a better understanding of who I am and why I say the things that I do. With that being said, we are going to dive in and continue our exploration of Isis Unveiled with Part 2, Chapter 2, Part 2. To substantiate our accusation that the Latin Church first despoiled the Kabbalists and the urges of their magical rites and ceremonies before hurling anathemas upon their devout, devoted heads, we will now translate for the reader fragments from the forms of exorcism employed by Kabbalists and Christians. The identity in phraseology may, perhaps, disclose one of the reasons why the Romish Church has always desired to keep the faithful in ignorance of the meaning of her Latin prayers and ritual. Only those directly invested in the deception have had the opportunity to compare the rituals of the church and the magicians. The best Latin scholars were, until a comparatively recent date, either churchmen or depended upon the church. Common people could not read Latin, and even if they could, the reading of the books on magic was prohibited under the penalty of anathema and excommunication. The cunning device of the confessional made it almost impossible to consult, even surreptitiously, what the priest called a grimoire, a devil's scrawl, or ritual of magic. To make assurance doubly sure, the church began destroying or concealing everything of the kind she could lay her hands upon. The following are translated from the Kabbalistic ritual that was generally known as the Roman ritual. The latter was promulgated in 1851 and 1852 under the sanction of Cardinal Engelbert, Archbishop of Malines, and the Archbishop of Paris. Speaking of it, the demonologist de Mossu says, It is the ritual of Paul V, revised by the most learned of the modern popes, by the contemporary of Voltaire, Benedict the Fourteenth, the Kabbalistic, and the way this is set up. Let's see if I can get them both on here. Wow, what happened there? Okay, there we go. Okay, so Kabbalistic, Jewish and pagan, is set next to the Roman Catholic, and we will just slide between them, I guess. The exorcism of salt. The priest magician blesses the salt and says, Creature of salt, in thee may remain the wisdom of God, and may it preserve from all corruption our minds and bodies. And the Roman Catholic is, the priest blesses the salt and says, Creature of salt, I exercise thee in the name of the living God, become the health of the soul and of the body. Everywhere where thou art, May the unclean be put to flight. Amen. All right, back to the pagan here. We have through Hokamel, God of Wisdom, and the power of Rubach Hokamel, God of the Spirit of the Holy Ghost. May the spirits of matter, bad spirits before it, recede. Amen. All right, then we have the exorcism of water and ashes. Creature of the water, I exercise thee by the three names which are Netza, Hod, and Jerod, the Kabbalistic Trinity, in the beginning and in the end, by the Alpha and Omega, which are in the spirit Azoth, Holy Ghost, or the Universal Soul. I ex exercise and abjure thee, wandering eagle. May the Lord command thee by the wings of the bull and his flaming sword, the cherub placed at the east gate of Eden. The Catholic exorcism of water, creature of the water, in the name of the Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, be exorcised. I adjure thee in the name of the Lamb, 
the magician, says Bo, or Ox, per Alice Tori, of the lamb that trod upon the basilisk and the aspic, and who crushes under his foot the lion and the dragon. Right. The exorcism of the elemental spirit. Serpent, in the name of the Tetragrammaton, the Lord, he commands thee, by the angel and the lion. Angel of darkness, obey, and run away with this holy, exorcised water. Eagle in chains, obey this sign, and retreat before the breath, moving serpent, crawl at my feet, or be tortured by this sacred fire, and evaporate before this holy incense. Let water return to water, the elemental spirit of water. Let the fire burn and the air circulate. Let the earth return to earth by the virtue of the pentagram, which is the morning star. And in the name of the tetragrammaton, which is traced in the center of the cross of light. Amen. <clears throat> and the Catholic exorcism of the devil. O Lord, let him who carries along with him the terror flee, struck in his turn by terror and defeated. O thou, who art the ancient serpent, tremble before the hand of him, who, having triumphed in the tortures of hell, de victus gem gemetibus inferni, recalled the souls to light. The more whilst thou decay, the more terrible will be thy torture, by him who reigns over the living and the dead, and who will judge the century by fire, Caecilum peregnium, etc. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. It is unnecessary to try the patience of the reader any longer, although we might multiply examples. It must not be forgotten that what that we have quoted from the latest revision of the ritual, that of 1851 too. If we were to go back to the former one, we would find a far more striking identity not merely of phraseology, but of ceremonial form. For the purpose of comparison, we have not even availed ourselves of the ritual of ceremonial magic of the Christian Kabbalist of the Middle Ages, wherein the language modeled upon a belief of the divinity of Christ is, with the exception of a stray expression here and there, identical with the Catholic ritual. The latter, however, makes one improvement, for the originality of which the Church should be allowed all credit. Certainly, nothing so fantastical could be found in a ritual of magic. Give place, apostrophizing the demon, it says, Give place to Jesus Christ, thou filthy, stinking, and ferocious beast. Dost thou rebel? Listen and tremble, Satan, enemy of the faith, enemy of the human race, introducer of death, root of all evil, promoter of vice, Soul of envy, origin of avarice, cause of discord, prince of homicide, whom God curses, author of incest and sacrilege, inventor of all obscenity, professor of the most detestable actions, and grand master of heretics, Dr. Hereticum. What, dost thou still stand, dost dare to resist, and thou knowest that Christ our Lord is coming? Give place to Jesus Christ, give place to the Holy Ghost, which, by his blessed Apostle Peter, has flung thee down before the public in the person of Simon the Magician. After such a shower of abuse, no devil, having the slightest feeling of self-respect, could remain in such company, unless, indeed... He should chance to be an Italian liberal, or King Victor Emmanuel himself, both of whom, thank to, thanks to Pius the Ninth, have become anathema proof. It really seems too bad to strip Rome of her, all her symbols at once, but justice must be done to the despoiled hierophants. Long before the sign of the cross was adopted as a Christian symbol, it was employed as a secret sign of recognition among neophytes and adepts, says Levi. <clears throat> the sign of the cross adopted by the Christians does not belong exclusively to them. It is Kabbalistic and represents the oppositions and quaternary equil equilibrium of the elements. We see, by the occult verse of the Pater, to which we have called attention in another work, that there were originally two ways of making it 
or at least, two very different formulas to express its meaning. One reserved for priests and initiates, the other given to neophytes and the profane. Thus, for example, the initiate, carrying his hand to the forehead, said, To thee. Then he added, Belong, and continued while carrying his hand to the breast, the kingdom, then to the left shoulder, justice, and to the right shoulder, and mercy. Then he joined the two hands, adding, Throughout the generating cycles, Tibi sunt malcut el gerburo et chasserer perionas, a sign of the cross, absolutely and magnificently cabalistic, which the profanations of Gnosticism made the militant and official church completely loose. How fantastical, therefore, is the assertion of the Father Ventura that, while Augustine was a Manichaean, a philosopher, ignorant of and refusing to humble himself before the sublimity of the grand Christian revelation, he knew nothing understood naught of God, man, or universe. He remained poor, small, obscure, sterile, and wrote nothing, did nothing, really grand or useful, but hardly had he become a Christian. When his reasoning powers and intellect, enlightened at the luminary of faith, elevated him to the most sublime heights of philosophy and theology, and his other proposition that Augustine's genius, as a consequence, developed itself in all its grandeur and prodigious fecundity, his intellect radiated with that immense splendor which, reflecting itself in his immortal writings, has never ceased for one moment during fourteen centuries to illuminate the church and the world. Whatever Augustine was, as a Manichaean, we leave to Father Ventura to discover, but that his accession to Christianity established an everlasting enmity between theology and science is beyond doubt. While forced to confess that, the Gentiles had possibly something divine and true in their doctrines, he nevertheless declared that for their superstition, idolatry, and pride they had to be detested, and unless they improved, to be punished by divine judgment. This furnishes the clue to the subsequent poly of the policy of the Christian church, even to our day. If the Gentiles did not choose to come into the church, all that was divine in their philosophy should go for naught, and the divine wrath of God should be visited upon their heads. What effect this produced is succinctly stated by Draper. No one did more than this father to bring science and religion into antagonism. It was mainly he who diverted the Bible from its true office, a guide to purity of life, and placed it in the perilous position of being the arbiter of human knowledge, an audacious tyranny over the mind of man. The example once set there was no want of followers. The works of the Greek philosophers were stigmatized as profane. The transcendently glorious achievements of the Museum of Alexandria were hidden from sight by a cloud of ignorance, mysticism, and unintelligible jargon, out of which there too often flashed the destroying lightnings of ecclesiastical vengeance. <clears throat> Augustine and Cyprian admit that Hermes and Hostanes believed in one true God, the first two maintaining, as well as the two pagans, that he is invisible and incomprehensible except spiritually. Moreover, we invite any man of intelligence, provided he be not a religious fanatic, after reading fragments chosen at random from the works of Hermes and Augustine on the deity, to decide which of the two gives a more philosophical definition of the unseen father. We have at least one writer of fame who is an, of our opinion. Draper calls the Austin, Augustinian productions a rhapsodical de conversation with God, an incoherent dream. Father Ventura depicts the saint as attitudinizing before an astonished world upon the most sublime heights of philosophy. But here steps in again the same unprejudiced critic 
who passes the following remarks on this colossus of patristic philosophy. Was it for this preposterous scheme, he asked, this product of ignorance and audacity, that the works of the Greek philosophers were to be given up? It was none too soon that the great critics, who appeared at the Reformation, by comparing the works of these writers with one another, brought them to their proper level, and taught us to look upon them all with contempt. For such men as Plotinus, Porphyry, Iamblichus, Apollonius, and even Simon Magus, to be accused of having formed a pact with the devil, whether the latter personage exists or not, is so absurd as to need but little refutation. If Simon Magus, the most problematical of all in a historical sense, ever existed otherwise than in the overheated fancy of Peter and the other apostles, he was evidently no worse than any of his adversaries. A difference in religious views, however great, is insufficient, per se, to send one person to heaven and the other to hell. Such uncharitable and preemptory doctrines might have been taught in the Middle Ages, but it is too late now for even the church to put forward this traditional scarecrow. Research begins to suggest that which, that which, if ever verified, will bring eternal disgrace upon the church of the Apostle Peter, whose very imposition of herself upon that disciple must be regarded as the most unverified and unverifiable of the assumptions of the Catholic clergy. The erudite author of Supernatural Religion assiduously endeavors to prove that by Simon Magus, we must understand the Apostle Paul, whose epistles were secretly as well as openly calumniated by Peter and charged with containing this noetic learning. The Apostle of the Gentiles was brave, outspoken, sincere, and very learned. The Apostle of Circumcision, cowardly, cautious, insincere, and very ignorant. That Paul has been partially at least, if not completely, initiated in the theurgic mysteries, admits of little doubt. His language, the phraseology, so peculiar to the Greek philosophers, contain expressions used but by the initiates, and so many sure earmarks of that supposition. We have talked before, and we will definitely talk again, about how Paul was in direct opposition to all of the apostles, right? Paul never actually met Jesus. Paul holds the exact same authority that I do, a spiritual revelation. He never actually met Jesus, and he was in direct contention with everyone who did. Everyone who actually studied at the foot of Jesus did not hold the same views as Paul. And yet, our Bible is written mostly in the New Testament by Paul. That's a problem. Right? That's, that's a very severe problem. If the rock upon which the church is to be built is in direct opposition to what you actually built the church out of, that's a problem. <clears throat> Our suspicion has been strengthened by an able article in one of the New York periodicals entitled Paul and Plato, in which the author puts forward one remarkable, and for us, very precious observation. In his epistles to the Corinthians, he shows Paul abounding with expressions suggested by the initiations of Sabasius and Lucius and the lectures of the Greek philosophers. He, Paul, designates himself an idiotis, a person unskillful in the word, but not in the gnosis or philosophical learning. We speak wisdom among the perfect or initiated, he writes, not the wisdom of this world, nor of the archons of this world, but divine wisdom in a mystery, secret, which none of the archons of this world knew. What else can the apostle mean by these unequivocal words, but that he himself, as belonging to the misty, initiated, spoke of things shown and explained only in the mysteries? The divine wisdom in a mystery which none of the archons of this world knew has evidently some direct reference to the Basilius of the Eleusinian initiation who did know. 
The Basilius belonged to the staff of the great Hierophant and was an archon of Athens. And as such, he was one of the chief mystae belonging to the interior mysteries to which a very select and small number obtained an entrance. The magistrates supervising the Eleusinians were called archons. Another proof that Paul belonged to the circle of the initiates lies in the following fact. The apostle had his head shorn at Cincrea, where Lucius Alpusius was initiated because he had a vow. The Nazas, or set apart, as we see in the Jewish scriptures, had to cut their hair which they wore long and which no razor touched at any other time and sacrifice it on the altar of initiation. And the Nazars were a class of Chaldean theurgists. We will show further that Jesus belonged to this class. Paul declares that, according to the grace of God which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. There might be a clue as to why the book was written by him and not by the people who actually knew Jesus. This expression, master builder, used only once in the whole Bible and by Paul may be considered as a whole revelation. In the mysteries, the third part of the sacred rites was called epoptia or revelation, reception into the secrets. In substance, it means that that stage of divine clairvoyance, when everything pertaining to this earth disappears and earthly sight is paralyzed, and the soul is united, free and pure with its spirit or God. But the real significance of the word is overseeing from I see myself. In Sanskrit, the word evapto has the same meaning as well as to obtain. The word epoptia is a compound one from ep ep upon and to look, an overseer and an, an inspector, also used for a master builder. The title of Master Mason in Freemasonry is derived from this in the sense used in the mysteries. Therefore, when Paul entitles himself a master builder, he is using a word preeminently Kabbalistic, theurgic, and Masonic, and one which no other apostle uses, and thus declares himself an adept, having the right to initiate others. If we search in this direction with those sure guides, the Grecian mysteries and the Kabbalah before us, it will be easy to find the reason, the secret reason, why Paul was so persecuted and hated by Peter, John, and James. The author of the Revelation was a Jewish Kabbalist per song, with all the hatred inherited by him from his forefathers towards the mysteries. His jealousy during the life of Jesus extended even to Peter, and it is but after the death of their common master that we see the two apostles, the former of whom wore the mitre and the petaloon of the Jewish rabbis, preach so zealously the rite of circumcision. In the eyes of Peter, Paul, who had humiliated him, and whom he felt so much his superior in Greek learning and philosophy must have naturally appeared as a magician, a man polluted with the gnosis, with the wisdom of the Greek mysteries. Hence, perhaps, Simon the magician. As to Peter, biblical criticism has shown before now that he had probably no more to do with the foundation of the Latin church at Rome than to furnish the pretext so readily seized upon by the cunning Irenaeus to benefit this church with the new name of the apostle, Petra, or Kepha, a name which allowed so readily, by an easy play upon words, to connect it with the Petroma, a double set of stone tablets used by the Hierophant at the initiations during the final mystery. In this, perhaps, lies concealed the whole secret of the claims of the Vatican, as Professor Wilder happily suggests. In the Oriental countries, the designation Peter in Phoenician and Chaldaic and interpreter appears to have been the title of this personage's 
the Hierophant. There is in these facts some remainder of the peculiar circumstances of the Mosaic Law, and also of the claims of the Pope to be the successor of Peter, the Hierophant, or interpreter of the Christian religion. As such, we must concede to him, to some extent, the right to be such an interpreter. The Latin Church was faithfully preserved in symbols, rites, ceremonies, architecture, and even in the very dress of her clergy, the tradition of the pagan worship, of the public or exoteric ceremonies, we should add. <clears throat> Otherwise, her dogmas would embody more sense and contain less blasphemy against the majesty of the supreme and invisible God. An inscription found on the coffin of Queen Mentuhept of the 11th dynasty B.C., 2250 B.C., now proved to have been transcribed from the 17th chapter of the Book of the Dead, dating not later than 4500 B.C., is more than suggestive. This monumental text contains a group of hieroglyphics, which, when interpreted, read thus, Peter, P-T-R, R-F-S-U. Baron Bunsen shows this sacred formulary mixed up with a whole series of glosses and various interpretations on a monument 40 centuries old. This is identical with saying that the record, the true interpretation, was at that time no longer intelligible. We beg our readers to understand, he adds, that a sacred text, a hymn, containing the words of a departed spirit, existed in such a state about 4,000 years ago, as to be all but unintelligible to royal scribes. That it was unintelligible to the uninitiated among the latter is, a, is as well proved by the confused and contradictory glossaries as that it was a mystery word known to the hierophants of the sanctuaries and, moreover, a word chosen by Jesus to designate the office assigned by him to one of his apostles. This word, PTR, was partially interpreted, owing to another word similarly, similarly written in another group of hieroglyphics on a stele, a sign for it being an opened eye. Bunsen mentions, as another explanation of PTR, to show, It appears to me, he remarks, that RPTR is literally the old Aramaic and Hebrew patar, which occurs in the history of Josephus as a specific word for interpreting. Whence, also, pitrum is the term for interpretation of a text, a dream. In a manuscript of the first century, a combination of the Demotic and Greek text, and most probably one of the few which miraculously escaped the Christian vandalism of the second and third centuries, when all such precious manuscripts were burned as magical, we find occurring in several places a phrase which, perhaps, may show some light upon this question. One of the principal heroes of the manuscript, who is constantly referred to as the Judean Illuminator, or Initiate, is made to communicate but with his patar, the latter being written in Chaldaic characters. Once the latter word is coupled with the name Shimeon, Several times, the illuminator, who rarely breaks his contemplative solitude, is shown inhabiting a cave and teaching the multitudes of eager scholars standing outside, not orally, but through this patar. The latter receives the words and wisdom by applying his ear to a circular hole in a parishion which concealed the teacher from his listeners, and then conveys them with explanations and glossaries to the crowd. This, with a slight change, was the method used by Pythagoras, who, as we know, never allowed his neophytes to see him during the years of probation, but instructed them from behind a curtain in his cave. But, whether the illuminator of the greco demotic manuscript is identical with Jesus or not, the fact remains that we find him selecting a mystery, appellation for one who is made to appear later by the Catholic Church, 
as the janitor of the kingdom of heaven and the interpreter of Christ's will. The word batar or Peter locates both master and discipline disciple in the circle of initiation and connects them with the secret doctrine. The great hierophant of the ancient mysteries never allowed the candidates to see or hear him personally. He was the deus ex machina, the presiding but invisible deity, uttering his will and instructions through a second party. And, two thousand years later, we discovered that the Dalai Lamas of Tibet had been following for centuries the same traditional program during the most important, mis important religious mysteries of Lamism. If Jesus knew the secret meaning of the title bestowed on him, bestowed by him on Simon, then he must have been initiated. Otherwise, he could not have learned it, and if he was an initiate of either the Pythagorean Essenes, the Chaldean Magi, or the Egyptian priest, then the doctrine taught by him was but a portion of the secret doctrine taught by the pagan hierophants to the few select adepts admitted within the sacred Adaita. <clears throat> but we will discuss this question further on. For the present, we will endeavor to briefly indicate the extraordinary similarity, or rather identity, we should say, of rites and ceremonial dress of the Christian clergy with that of the Babylonians, Assyrians, Phoenicians, Egyptians, and other pagans of the hoary antiquity. If we would find the model of the papal tiara, we must search the annals of the ancient Assyrian tablets. We invite the reader to give his attention to Dr. Enman's illustrated work, Ancient, Pagan, and Modern Christian Symbolism. On page 64, he will readily recognize the headgear of the successor of St. Peter in the coiffure worn by the gods or angels in ancient Assyria. Well, it appears crowned by an emblem of the male trinity, the Christian cross. We may mention, in passing, says as Dr. Enman, that, as the Romanists adopted the mitre and tiara from the cursed brood of Ham, so they adopted the Episcopalian crook from the augurs of Etri Etruria, in the artistic form with which they clothed their angels from the painters and urn-makers, of Magna Grecia and Central Italy. Would we push our inquiries farther and seek to ascertain as much in relation to the nimbus and tonsure of the Catholic priest and monk? We shall find undeniable proofs that they are solar emblems. Knight, in his Old England Pictorially Illustrated, gives a drawing by St. Augustine representing an ancient Christian bishop in a dress probably identical with that worn by the great saint himself. The pallium, or the ancient stole of the bishop, is the feminine sign when worn by a priest in worship. The, on St. Augustine's picture, it is bedecked with the Buddhistic crosses, and in its whole appearance is a representation of the Egyptian Tao, assuming slightly the figure of the letter Y. Its lower end is the mark of the masculine triad, says Enman. The right hand of the figure has the forefinger extended like the Assyrian priest while doing homage to the grove. When a male dons the pelium in worship, he becomes the representative of the trinity and the unity, the arbor or mystic four. Immaculate is Our Lady Isis is the legend around an engraving of Serapis and Isis, described by the king in the Gnostics and their remains, Ikipia Ikik Aligni. The very terms applied afterwards to that personage, the Virgin Mary, who succeeded to her form, titles, symbols, rites, and ceremonies. Thus, her devotees carried into the new priesthood the former badges of their profession, the obligation of celibacy, the tonsure and the surplus, omitting, unfortunately, the frequent ablutions prescribed by the ancient creed. The black virgins, so highly reverenced in certain French cathedrals, proved, when at last critically examined, basalt figures of Isis. 
Before the shrine of Jupiter Ammon were suspended tinkling bells, from the sound of whose chiming the priests gathered the auguries. A golden bell and a pomegranate around the hem of the robe was the result with the Mosaic Jews. But in the Buddhistic system, during the religious services, the god of the Devaloka are always invoked and invited to descend upon the altars by the ringing of bells suspended in the Padogas, pagodas. The bell of the sacred table of Shiva at Kunhama is described in Kailasa, and every Buddhist Vahara and Lamasiri had its bells. <clears throat> we thus see that the bells used by Christians come to them directly from the Buddhistic, Tibetans, and Chinese. The beads and rosaries have the same origin and have been used by Buddhist monks for over 2300 years. The lingams of the Hindu temples are ornamented upon certain days with large berries from a tree sacred to Mahadevi, which are strung into rosaries. The title of nun is an Egyptian word and had with them the actual meaning. The Christians did not even take the trouble of translating the word nona. The orale of the saints was used by the antediluvian artist of Babylonia whenever they desire to honor or deify a mortal's head. In a celebrated picture in Moore's Hindu pantheon entitled Krishna nursed by Devaki from a highly finished picture, the Hindu virgin is represented as seated on a lounge and nursing Krishna. The hair brushed back, the long veil and the golden aureolo, aureolo around the virgin's head as well as that of the Hindu savior are striking. No Catholic, well versed as he might be in the mysterious symbolism of iconology, would hesitate for a moment to worship at that shrine of the Virgin Mary, the mother of his God. In Indor Suba, the south entrance of the caves of Alora, may be seen to this day the figure of Indra's wife, Indrani, sitting with her infant sun god, pointing a finger to heaven with the same gesture as the Italian Madonna and her child. In pagan and Christian symbolism, the author gives a figure from a medieval woodcut, the like of which we have seen by dozens in old Psalters, in which the Virgin Mary, with her infant, be is represented as the Queen of Heaven on a crescent moon, emblem of virginity. Being before the sun, she almost eclipses its light. Than this, nothing could be more completely identify the Christian mother and child with Isis and Horus, Ishtar, Venus, Juno, and a host of other pagan goddesses who have been called Queen of Heaven, Queen of the Universe, Mother of God, Spouse of God, the Celestial Virgin, the Heavenly Peacemaker, etc. Such pictures are not purely astronomical. They represent the male god and the female goddess, as the sun and moon in conjunction, the union of the triad with the unit. The horns of the cow on the head of Isis have the same significance. And so, above, below, outside and inside, the Christian church, in the priestly garments and the religious rites, we recognize the stamp of exoteric heathenism. On no subject within the wide range of human knowledge has the world been more blinded or deceived with such persistent mis misrepresentation as on that of antiquity. Its hoary past and its religious faiths have been misrepresented and trampled under the feet of its successors. Its hierophants and prophets, Miste and Epopte, of the once sacred Adida of the temple shown as demon demoniacs, and devil worshippers. Donned in the despoiled garments of the victim, the Christian priest now anathematizes the latter with rites and ceremonies which he has learned from the theurgists themselves. The Mosaic Bible is used as a weapon against the people who furnished it. The heathen philosopher is cursed under the very roof which has witnessed his initiation, and the monkey of God an example, the devil of Tertullian, the originator and founder of magical theurgy, the science of illusions and lies, whose father and author is the demon, is exercised with holy water by the hand, 
which holds the identical litus with which the ancient augur, after a solemn prayer, used to determine the regions of heaven and evoke, in the name of the highest, the minor god, now termed the devil, who unveiled to his eyes futurity and enabled him to prophesy. On the part of the Christians and the clergy, it is nothing but shameful ignorance, prejudice, and that contemptible pride so boldly denounced by one of their own reverend ministers, T. Gross, which rails against all investigation, as a useless or a criminal labor, when it must be feared that they will result in the overthrow of pre-established systems of faith. <laughs> On the part of the scholars, it is the same apprehension of the possible necessity of having to modify some of their erroneously established theories of science. Nothing but such pitiable prejudice, says Gross, can have thus misrepresented the theology of heathenism and distorted, nay, caricatured, its forms of religious worship. It is time that posterity should raise its voice in vindication of violated truth, and that the present age should learn a little of that common sense of which it boasts with as much self-complacency as if the prerogative of reason was the birthright only of modern times. <clears throat> All this gives a sure clue as to the real cause of the hatred felt by the early and medieval Christian towards his pagan brothers and dangerous rival. We hate but what we fear. The Christian thaumaturgist, once having broken all association with the mysteries of the temples and with these schools so renowned for magic, described by St. Hilarion, could certainly expect but little to rival the pagan wonder workers. No apostle, with the exception, perhaps, of healing by mesmeric power, has ever equaled Apollonius of Tyana, and the scandal created among the apostles by the miracle-doing Simon Magus is too notorious to be repeated here again. How is it, asked Justin Martyr, in evident dismay, how is it that the talismans of Apollonius have power in certain members of creation, for they prevent as we see, the fury of the waves, and the violence of the winds, and the attacks of wild beasts. And whilst our Lord's miracles are preserved by tradition alone, those of Apollonius are most numerous, and actually manifested in present facts, so as to lead astray all beholders. This perplexed martyr solves the problem by attributing very correctly the efficiency and potency of the charms used by Apollonius in his profound knowledge of the sympathies and antipathies, or repugnances, of nature. Unable to deny the evident superiority of their enemy's powers, the fathers had recourse to the old but ever successful method, that of slander. They honored the theurgists with the same insinuating calumny that had been resorted to by the Pharisees against Jesus. Thou hast a demon, the elders of the Jewish synagogue had said to him. Thou hast the devil, repeated the cunning fathers with equal truth, addressing the pagan thaumaturgist and the widely bruited charge erected later in an article of faith, won the day. But the modern heirs of these ecclesiastical falsifiers who charge magic, spiritualism, and even magnetism with being produced by a demon forget, or perhaps never read the classics. None of our bigots has ever looked with more scorn on the abuses of magic than did the true initiate of old. No modern or even medieval law could be more severe than that of the Hierophant. True, he had more discrimination, charity, and justice than the Christian clergy. For while banishing the unconscious sorcerer, the person troubled with a demon, from within the sacred precincts of the Adita, the priest, instead of having, instead of mercilessly burning him, took care of the unfortunate possessed one, having hospitals expressly for that purpose in the neighborhood of temples. The ancient medium, if obsessed, was taken care of and restored to health. <clears throat> but with one who had, by conscious witchcraft, acquired powers dangerous to his fellow creatures, the priests of old were as severe as justice herself. 
any person accidentally guilty of homicide or of any crime or convicted of witchcraft was excluded from the Eleusinian mysteries. And so were they from all others. This law, mentioned by all writers of the initi ancient initiation, speaks for itself. The claim of Augustine that all the explanations given by the Neoplatonists were invented by themselves is absurd, for nearly every ceremony in their true and successive order is given by Plato himself, in a more or less covered way. The mysteries are as old as the world, and one well versed in the esoteric mythologies of various nations can trace them back to the days of the Ante Vedic period in India. A condition of the strictest virtue and purity is required from the Vatau, or candidate, in India before he can become an initiate, whether he aims to be a simple fakir, a purohita, public priest, or a sanyasi, a saint of the second degree of initiation, the most holy as the most revered of them all. After having conquered in the terrible trials pre preliminary to admittance to the inner temple in the subterranean crypts of his pagoda, the Sanayasi passes the rest of his life in the temple, practicing the 84 rules and 10 virtues prescribed by the yogis. No one who has not practiced during his whole life the 10 virtues, which the divine Manu makes incumbent as a duty, can be initiated into the mysteries of the council, say the Hindu books of initi initiation. These virtues are resignation, the act of rendering good for evil, temperance, probity, purity, chastity, repression of the physical senses, the knowledge of the holy scriptures, that of the superior soul, spirit, worship of truth, abstinence from anger, these virtues must alone direct the life of the true yogi. No unworthy adept ought to defile the ranks of the holy initiates by his presence for twenty-four hours. The adept becomes guilty after having once broken any one of these vows. Surely the exercise of such virtues is inconsistent with the idea one has of devil worship and lasciviousness of purpose. And now we will try to give a clear insight into one of the chief objects of this work. What we desire to prove is that underlying every ancient popular religion was the same ancient wisdom doctrine, one and identical, professed and practiced by the initiates of every country, who alone were aware of its existence and importance. To ascertain its origin and the precise age in which it was matured, is now beyond human possibility. A single glance, however, is enough to assure uh, one that it could not have attained the marvelous perfection in which we find it pictured to us in the relics of the various esoteric systems, except after a succession of ages. A philosophy so profound, a moral code so ennobling, and practical results so conclusive and so uniformly demonstrable is not the growth of a generation or even a single epoch. <clears throat> fact must have been piled upon fact, deduction upon deduction, science have begotten science, and myriads of the brightest human intellects have reflected upon the laws of nature before this ancient doctrine had concrete shape. The proofs of this identity of a fundamental doctrine in the old religions are found in the prevalence of a system of initiation, in the secret sacerdotal caste who had the guardianship of mystical words of power and a public display of a phenomenal control over natural forces indicating association with preterhuman beings. Every approach to the mysteries of all these nations was guarded with the same jealous care and, in all, the penalty of death was inflicted upon initiates of any degree who divulged the secrets entrusted to them. We have seen that such was the case in, in the Eleusinian and Bacchic mysteries among the Chaldean Magi and the Egyptian Hierophants. While with the Hindus, from whom they were all derived, the same rule has prevailed from time immemorial. We are left in no doubt upon this point, for the Agurushada Parikshai says explicitly, 
every initiate, to whatever degree he may belong, who reveals the great sacred formula, must be put to death. Naturally enough, this same extreme penalty was prescribed in all the multifarious sects and brotherhoods, which, at a different period, have sprung from the ancient stock. We find it with the early Essenes, Gnostics, the Ergic Neoplatonist, and medieval philosophers, and, in our day, even the Masons perpetuate the memory of the old obli obligations in the penalties of throat cutting, dismemberment, and disemboweling with which the candidate is threatened. As the Masonic master's word is communicated only at low breath, so the self-same precaution is prescribed in the Chaldean Book of Numbers and the Jewish Merkaba. When initiated, the neophyte was led by an ancient to a secluded spot, and there the latter whispered in his ear the great secret. The Mason swears, under the most frightful penalties, that he will not communicate the secrets of any degree to a brother of an inferior degree. And the Agurushada Parikshai says, In the initiate of the third degree, who reveals before the prescribed time to the initiates of the second degree, the superior truths must be put to death. Again, the Masonic apprentice consents to have his tongue torn out by the roots if he devotes anything to a profane. And in the Hindu books of initiation, the same Agurushado Parikshai, we find that any initiate of the first degree, the lowest, who betrays the secrets of his initiation to members of other castes, for whom the science should be a closed book, must have his tongue cut out and suffer other mutilations. As we proceed, we will point out the evidences of this identity of vows, formulas, rites, and doctrines between the ancient faiths. We will also show that not only their memory is still preserved in India, but also that of the secret association is still alive and as active as ever. That, after reading what we have to say, it may be inferred that the chief pontiff and hierophants, the Brahmata, Bra Brahmatatma, is still accessible to those who know, though perhaps recognized by another name, and that the ramifications of his influence extend throughout the world. But we will now return again to the early Christian period. <clears throat> As though he were not aware that there were, was, any esoteric significance to the exoteric symbols, and that the mysteries themselves were composed of two parts. The lesser at Agurai and the higher ones at Eleusinia. Clemens, Alexandrinus, with a rancorous bigotry that one might expect from a renegade Neoplatonist, but is astonished to find in this generally honest and learned father stigmatized the mysteries as indecent and diabolical. Whatever were the rites enacted among the neophytes before they passed to a higher form of instruction, However misunderstood were the trials of catharsis or purification, during which they were submitted to every kind of probation, and however much the immaterial or physical aspect might have led to calumny, it is but wicked prejudice which can compel a person to say that under this external meaning there was not a far deeper and spiritual significance. It is positively absurd to judge the ancients from our own standpoint of propriety and virtue. The most assuredly, it is not for the church, which now stands accused by all the modern symbologists of having adopted precisely these same emblems in their coarsest aspect, and feels herself powerless to refute the accusations, to throw the stone at those who were her models. When men like Pythagoras, Plato, and Iamblichus, known for their severe morality, took part in the mysteries, and spoke of them with veneration, it ill behooves our modern critics to judge them so rashly upon their merely external aspects. Iamblichus explains the worst, and his explanation, for an unprejudiced mind, ought to be perfectly plausible. 
Exhibitions of this kind, he says, in the mysteries were designed to free us from licentious passions by gratifying the sight, and at the same time vanquishing all evil thought, through the awful sanctity which, with which these rites were accompanied. The wisest and best men in the pagan world, as Dr. Warburton, are unanimous in this, that the mysteries were instituted pure, and proposed the noblest ends by the worthiest means. In these celebrated rites, although persons of both sexes and all classes were allowed to take part, <clears throat> and a participation in them was even obligatory, very few indeed attain the higher and final initiation. The gradation of the mysteries is given to given us by Proclus in the fourth book of his Theology of Plato. The perfective rite proceeds in order of the initiation, Muesis, and the initiation, Epoptia, or the final apocalypse revelation. Theon of Smyrna in Mathematica also divides the mystic rites into five parts, the first of which is the previous purification. <clears throat> For neither are the mysteries communicated to all who are willing to receive them. There are on certain persons who are prevented by the voice of the crier, since it is necessary that such as are not expelled from the mysteries for should first be refined by certain purifications with the reception of the sacred rites succeeds. The third part is denominated a Poptia, or reception, and the fourth, which is the end and design of the revelation, is the binding of the head and fixing of the crowns. Whether after this he, the initiated person, becomes an hierophant, or sustains some other part of the sacerdotal office. But the fifth, which is produced from all of these, is friendship and interior communion with God. And this was the last and most awful of all the mysteries. There are writers who have often wondered at the meaning of this claim to a friendship and interior communion with God. Christian authors have denied the pretensions of the pagans to such a communion, affirming that only Christian saints were and are capable of enjoying it. Materialistic skeptics have altogether scoffed at the idea of both. After long ages of religious materialism and spiritual stagnation, it has most certainly become difficult, if not altogether impossible, to substantiate the claims of either party. The old Greeks, who had once crowded around the Agora of Athens with its altar to the unknown god are no more, and their descendants firmly believe that they have found the unknown in the Jewish Jehovah. The divine ecstasies of the early Christians have made room for visions of a more modern character, in perfect keeping with progress and civilization. The Son of Man, appearing to the rapt vision of the ancient Christian as coming from the seventh heaven in a cloud of glory and surrounded with angels and winged seraphim, has made room for a more prosaic and at the same time more business-like Jesus. The latter is now shown as making morning calls upon Mary and Martha in Bethany, as seating himself on the ottoman with the younger sister, a lover of ethics, while Martha goes off to the kitchen to cook. Anon, the heated fancy of a blasphemous Brooklyn preacher and harlequin, the Reverend Dr. Talmadge, makes us see her rushing back with besweated brow, a pitcher in one hand and tongs in the other, into the presence of Christ, and blowing him up for not caring that her sister hath left her to serve alone. From the birth of the solemn and majestic conception to the unrevealed deity of the ancient adepts, to such charactered descriptions of him who died on the cross for his philanthropic devotion to humanity. Long centuries have intervened, and their heavy tread seems to have almost entirely obliterated all sense of spiritual religion from the hearts of his professed followers. No wonder, then, that the sentence of Proclus is no longer understood by the Christians and is rejected as a vaglery by the materialist, who, in their negation, 
are less blasphemous and atheistical than many of the reverends and members of the churches. But, although the Greek epoptai are no more, we have now, in our own age, a people more ancient than the oldest Hellenes, who practiced these so-called preterhuman gifts to the same extent as did their ancestors far earlier than the days of Troy. It is to this people that we draw the attention of the psychologist and philosopher. One need not go very deep into the literature of the Orientalist to become convinced that in most cases they do not even suspect that in the arcane philosophy of India there are depths which they have not sounded and cannot sound, for they pass on without perceiving them. There is a pervading tone of conscious superiority, a ring of contempt in the treatment of Hindu metaphysics, as though the European mind is alone enlightened enough to polish the rough diamond of the old Sanskrit writers and separate right from wrong for the benefit of their descendants. We see them disputing over the external forms of expression without a conception of the great vital truths these hide from the profane view. As a rule, the Brahmins, says Jacoliot, rarely go beyond the class of Grihesta, priest of the vulgar caste, and Purahita, exercisers, divines, prophets, and evocators of spirits. And yet, we shall see, once we have touched upon the, the question and study of manifestations and phenomena, that these initiates of the first degree, the lowest, attribute to themselves and, in appearance, possess faculties developed to a degree which has never been equaled in Europe. As to the initiates of the second and especially of the third category, they pretend to be enabled to ignore time, space, and to command life and death. Such initiates as these M. Jacoliot did not meet, for, as he says himself, they only appear on the most solemn occasions, and when the faith of the multitudes has to be strengthened by phenomena of a superior order. <clears throat> they are never seen, either in the neighborhood of or even inside the temples, except at the grand quin quinennial festival of the fire. On that occasion, they appear about the middle of the night on a platform erected in the center of the sacred lake, like so many phantoms, and by their conjurations they illumine the space. A fiery column of light extends from around them, rushing from earth to heaven. Unfamiliar sounds vibrate through the air, and five or six hundred thousand Hindus, gathered from every part of India to contemplate these demigods, throw themselves with their faces buried in the dust, invoking souls of their ancestors. Let any impartial person read the Spiritism des Dans le Monde, and he cannot believe that this implacable rationalist, as Jacolia prides and takes pride in terming himself, said one word more than is warranted by what he had seen. His statements support and are corroborated by those of other skeptics. As a rule, the missionaries, even after passing half a lifetime in the country of devil worship, as they call India, either disingenuously deny altogether what they cannot help knowing to be true, or ridiculously attribute phenomena to this power of the devil that outrival the miracles of the apostolic, apostolic ages. Sorry. And what do we... S and what do we see this French author, notwithstanding his incorrigible rationalism, forced to admit, after having narrated the greatest wonders? Watch the fakirs as he would. He is compelled to bear the strongest testimony to their perfect honesty in the matter of their miraculous phenomena. <clears throat> Never, he says, have we succeeded in detecting a single one in the act of deceit. One fact should be noted by all who, without having been to India, still fancy they are clever enough to expose the fraud of pretended magicians. This skilled and cool observer, this redoubtable materialist, after his long sojourn in India, affirms, We unhesitatingly avow that we have not met, either in India or in Ceylon, a single European, 
even among the oldest residents, who has been able to indicate the means employed by these devotees for the production of these phenomena. And how should they? Does not this zealous orientalist confess to us that even he, who had every available means at hand to learn many of their rites and doctrines at first hand, failed in his attempts to make the Brahmins explain to him their secrets? All that our most diligent inquiries of the Porohitas could elicit from them respecting the acts of their superiors, the invisible initiates of the temples, amounts to very little. And again, speaking of one of the books, he confesses that, while purporting to reveal all that is desirable to know, it falls back into the mysterious formulas in combinations of magical and occult letters, the secret of which it has been impossible for us to penetrate, etc. The fakirs, although they can never reach beyond the first degree of initiation, are, notwithstanding, the only agents between the living world and the silent brothers, or those initiates who never cross the thresholds of their sacred dwellings. The Fukara yogis belong to the temples, and who knows what these cenobites of the sanctuary have far more to do with the psychological phenomena which attend the fakirs, and have been so graphically described by Jacolia than the Petrus themselves. Who can but who can tell but that the fluidic specter of the ancient Brahmin seen by Jacoliot was the Sin Skin Sinleka, the spiritual double of one of these mysterious sannyasi. Although the story has been translated and commented upon by Professor P Purdy of Geneva, still we will venture to give it in Jacoliot's own words. A moment after the disappearance of the hands, the fakir, continuing his evocations, mantras, more earnestly than ever, a cloud, like the first but more opalescent and more opaque, began to hover near the small brazier, which, by request of the Hindu, I constantly fed with live coals. Little by little it assumed the form entire human, and I distinguished the spectre, for I cannot call it otherwise, of an old Brahmin sacrificator kneeling near the little brazier. He bore on his head the sign sacred to Vishnu, and around his body the triple cord, sign of the initiates of the priestly caste. He joined his hands above his head, as during the sacrifices, and his lips moved as if they were reciting prayers. At a given moment he took a pinch of perfumed power, powder and threw it upon the coals. It must have been a strong compound, for a thick smoke arose on the instant and filled the two chambers. When it was dissipated, I perceived the spectre, which two steps from me was extending to me its fleshless hand. I took it in mine, making a salutation, and I was astonished to find it, although bony and hard, warm and living. Art thou indeed, said I at this moment in a loud voice, an ancient inhabitant of the earth? <clears throat> I had not finished the question when the word, um, yes, appeared, and then disappeared in letters of fire on the breast of the old Brahmin, with an effect much like that which the world would produce if written in the dark with a stick of phosphorus. Will you leave me nothing in token of your visit? I continued. The spirit broke the triple cord composed of three strands of cotton which begirt his loins, gave it to me, and vanished at my feet. <clears throat> O oh, Brahma, what is this mystery which takes place every night when lying on the matten with eyes closed, the body is lost sight of, and the soul escapes to enter into conversation with the Pitris? Watch over it, O oh, Brahma, when forsaking the resting body, it goes away to hover over the waters, to wander in the immensity of heaven and penetrate into the dark and mysterious nooks of the valleys and grand forces of the Haimavat. Agrushara Parishika. The fakirs, when belonging to some particular temple, never act but under orders, not one of them, unless he has reached a degree of extraordinary sanctity, is freed from the influence and guidance of his guru, his teacher, who first initiated and instructed him in the mysteries of the occult sciences. 
Like the subject of the European mesmerizer, the average fakir can never rid himself entirely of the psychological influence exercised on him by his guru. Having passed two or three hours in the silence and solitude of the inner temple in prayer and meditation, the fakir, when he emerges thence, is mesmerically strengthened and prepared. He produces wonders far more varied and powerful than before he entered. The master has laid his hands upon him and the fakir feels strong. It may be shown on the authority of many Brahmanical and Buddhistic sacred books that there has ever existed a great difference between adepts of the higher order and purely psychological sub subjects. Like many of these fakirs, who are mediums in a certain qualified sense. True, the fakir is ever talking of Petrus, and this is natural, for they are pro his protecting deities. But are the Petris disembodied human beings of our race? This is the question, and we will discuss it in a moment. We say that the fakir may be regarded in a degree as a medium, for he is. What is not generally known, under the direct mesmeric influence of a living adept, his sannyasi or guru. When the latter dies, the power of the former, unless he has received the last transfer of spiritual forces, wanes, and often even disappears. Why, if it were otherwise, should the fakirs have been excluded from the right of advancing to the second and third degree? the lives of many of them exemplifying a degree of self-sacrifice and sanctity unknown and utterly incomprehensible to Europeans, who shudder at the bare thought of such self-inflicted tortures. <clears throat> but, however shielded from control by vulgar and earthbound spirits, however wide the chasm between a debasing influence and their self-controlled souls, and however well protected by the seven-knotted magical bamboo rod which he receives from the guru, still the fakir lives in the outer world of sin and matter, and it is possible that his soul may be tainted, perchance, by the magnetic emanations from profane objects and persons, and thereby open an access to strange spirits and gods. To admit one so situated, not under one not under any and all circumstances sure of the mastery over himself to a knowledge of the awful mysteries and priceless secrets of initiation would be impracticable. It would not only imperil the security of that which must at all hazards be guarded from profanation, but it would be consenting to admit behind the veil of a fellow being whose mediumistic irresponsibility might at any moment cause him to lose his life through an involuntary indiscretion. The same law which prevailed in the Eleusinian mysteries before our era holds good now in India. Not only must the adept have mastery over himself, but he must be able to control the inferior grades of spiritual beings, nature spirits, and earthbound souls. In short, the very ones by whom if by any, the fakir is liable to be affected. <clears throat> For the objector to affirm that the Brahman adepts and the fakirs admit that of themselves they are powerless and can only act with the help of disembodied human spirits is to state that these Hindus are unacquainted with the laws of their sacred books and even the meaning of the word pitras. The laws of Manu, the Atharva Veda, and other books Prove what we now say. All that exists, says the Artharva Veda, is in the power of the gods. The gods are under the power of magical conjurations. The magical conjurations are under the control of the Brahmins. Hence, the gods are in the power of the Brahmins. This is logical, albeit seemingly paradoxical, and it is the fact. And this fact will explain to those who have not hitherto had the clue among whom Jacoliot must be numbered, as will appear on reading his works, why the fakir should be confined to the first or lowest degree of that course of initiation whose highest adepts, or hierophants, are the sannyasis, or members of the ancient supreme council of seventy. Moreover, in book one of the Hindu Genesis, or book of creation of Manu, 
The Pitras are called the lunar ancestors of the human race. They belong to a race of beings different from ourselves and cannot properly be called human spirits in the sense of which the spiritualists use this term. This is what is said of them. Then they, the gods, created the Jakshas, the Rakshasas, the Pish, Pisachas, the Gandharvas, the Apsaras, the Asuras, the Nagas, the Sarpas, and the Suparnas, and the Pitris, Luna ancestors of the human race. See Institutes of Manu, Book 1, Sloka 37, where the Pitris are termed progenitors of mankind. The Pitris are a distinct race of spirits belonging to the mythological hierarchy, or rather to the Kabbalistic nomenclature, and must be included with the good genie, the demons of the Greeks, or the inferior gods of the invisible world. And when a fakir attributes his phenomenon to the Pitris, he means only what the ancient philosophers and theurgists meant when they maintained that all the miracles were obtained through the intervention of the gods, or the good and bad demons, who control the powers of nature, the elementals, who are subordinate to the power of him who knows. A ghost or human phantom would be termed by a fakir palit or chutna, as that of the female human spirit pichalpai, not pitris. True, pitara means, plural, fathers, ancestors, and pitra i is a kinsman, but these words are used in quite different a sense than from that of the pitris evoked in the mantras. To maintain before a devout Brahmin or a fakir that anyone can converse with the spirits of the dead would be to shock him with what would appear to him blasphemy. Does not the concluding verse of the Bhagavat state that this supreme felicity is alone reserved to the holy sannyasis or gurus and yogi? Long before they finally rid themselves of their mortal envelopes, the souls who have practiced only good, such as those of the Sanyasis and the Vanaprastas, acquire the faculty of conversing with the souls which preceded them to the Swarga. In this case, the Pitris, instead of Genii, are the spirits, or rather souls, of the departed ones. But they will freely communicate only with those whose atmosphere is as pure as their own, and to whose prayerful kalasa, invocation, they can respond without the risk of defiling their own celestial purity. When the soul of the invocator has reached the shayadam, or perfect identity of essence within the universal soul, when matter is utterly conquered, then the adept can freely enter into daily and hourly communion with those who, though unburdened with their corporeal forms, are still themselves progressing through the endless series of transformations included in the gradual approach to the Paramatama, or Grand Universal Soul. Bearing in mind that the Christian fathers have always claimed for themselves and their saints the name friends of God, and knowing that they borrowed this expression, with many others, from the technology of the pagan temples, it is but natural to expect them to show an evil temper whenever alluding to these rites. Ignorant as a role, and having no biographers as ignorant as themselves, we could not well expect them to find in the accounts that there be beatific visions, a descriptive beauty, such as we find in the pagan classics. Whether the visions and objective phenomenon claimed by both the fathers of the desert and the hierophants of the sanctuary are to be discredited or accepted as facts, the splendid imagery employed by Proclus and Apuleius in narrating the small portion of the final initiation that they dared reveal throws completely into the shade the plagiaristic tales of the Christian ascetics, faithful copies though they were intended to be. The story of the temptation of St. Anthony in the desert by a female demon is a parody upon the preliminary trials of the neophyte during the Mikra, or minor mysteries of Agre. Those rites at the thought of which Clemens railed so bitterly, and which represented the bereaved Demeter in search of her child, and her good-natured hostess, Boabo, 
without entering again into a demonstration that in Christian and especially Irish Roman Catholic churches, the same apparently indecent customs as the above prevailed until the end of the last century. We will recur to the untiring laborers of that honest and brave defender of the ancient faith, Thomas Taylor, and his works. However much dogmatic Greek scholarship may have found to say against his mistranslations, his memory must be dear to every true Platonist who seeks rather to learn the inner thought of the great philosopher than enjoy the mere external mechanism of his writings. Better classical translators may have rendered us, in more correct phraseology, Plato's words, but Taylor shows us Plato's meaning, and this is more than can be said of Zeller, Jowett, and their predecessors. Yet, as writes Professor A. Wilder, Taylor's works have met with favor at the hands of men capable of profound and recondite thinking, and it must be conceded that he was endowed with a superior qualification that of an intuitive perception of the interior meanings of the subjects which he considered. Others may have known more Greek, but he knew more Plato. Taylor devoted his whole useful life to the search after such old manuscripts as would enable him to have his own speculations concerning several obscure rites in the mysteries, corroborated by writers who had been initiated themselves. It is with full confidence in the assertions of various classical writers that we, that we say that ridiculous, perhaps licentious in some cases, as may appear ancient worship to the modern critic, it not, ought not have so appeared to the Christians. During the medieval ages, and even later, they accepted pretty nearly the same without understanding the secret import of its rites, and quite satisfied with the obscure and rather fantastic interpretations of their clergy, who accepted the exterior form and distorted the inner meaning. We are ready to concede in full justice that centuries have passed since the great majority of the Christian clergy, who are not allowed to pry into God's mysteries nor seek to explain that which the church has once accepted and established, have had the remotest idea of their symbolism, <clears throat> whether in its exoteric or esoteric meaning. Not so with the head of the church and its highest dignitaries. And if we fully agree with Inman that it is difficult to believe that the ecclesiastics who sanction the publication of such prints could have been as ignorant as modern ritualists, we are not at all prepared to believe with the same author that that the latter, if they knew the real meaning of the symbols commonly used by the Roman Church, would not have adopted them. To eliminate what is plainly derived from the sex and nature worship of the ancient heathens would be equivalent to pulling down the whole Roman Catholic image worship, the Madonna element, and reforming the faith to Protestantism. The enforcement of the late dogma of the Immaculation was prompted by this very secret reason. The science of some symbology was making too rapid progress. Blind faith in the Pope's infallibility and the in, in the Immaculate Nature of the Virgin and of her ancestral female lineage to a certain remove could alone save the Church from the indiscreet revelations of science. It was a clever stroke of policy on the part of the vice-regent of God. What matters, what matters it, if, by conferring upon her such an honor, as Don Pascale de Francisis naively expresses it, he has made a goddess of the Virgin Mary, an Olympian deity, who, having been by her very nature placed in the impossibility of sinning, can claim no virtue, no personal merit for her purity, precisely for which, as we are taught to believe in our younger days, she was chosen among all other women. If His Holiness has deprived her of this, perhaps, on the other hand, he thinks that he has endowed her with at least one physical attribute not shared by the other virgin goddesses. But even this new dogma, which, in company with the new claim to infallibility, has quasi-revolutionized the Christian world, it is not original with the Church of Rome. 
It is but a return to a hardly remembered heresy of the early Christian ages, that of the Collyridians, so called from their sacrificing cakes to the Virgin, whom they claim to be virgin born. The new sentence <clears throat> O oh, Virgin Mary, conceived without sin, <laughs> is simply a tardy acceptance of that which was at first deemed a blasphemous heresy by the Orthodox Fathers. To think for one moment that any of the popes, cardinals, or other high dignitaries were not aware from the first to the last of the external meanings of their symbols is to do injustice to their great learning and their spirit of Machiavellianism. It is to forget that the emissaries of Rome will never be stopped by any difficulty which can be skirted by the employment of Jesuitical artifice. The policy of complacent conformity was never carried to greater lengths than by the missionaries in Ceylon, who, according to the Abbe Dubois, certainly a learned and competent authority, conducted the images of the Virgin and Saviour on triumphal cars, imitated from the orgies of the Juggernaut, and introduced the dances from the Brahminical rites into the ceremonial of the church. Let us at least thank these black, black frolicked, black frocked politicians for their consistency in employing the car of the juggernaut, upon which the wicked heathen convey the lingam of Siva. To have used this car to carry its return in its turn, the Romish representative of the female principle in nature, is to show discrimination and a thorough knowledge of the oldest mythological conceptions. They have blended the two deities and thus represented in a Christian procession the heathen Brahma or Nora, the father, Nari, the mother, and Viraj, the son. Says Manu, the sovereign master who exists through himself divides his body into two halves, male and female, and from the union of these two principles is born Viraj, the son there was not a Christian father who could have been ignorant of these symbols and their physical meaning, for it is in this latter aspect that they were abandoned to the ignorant rabble. Moreover, they all had as good reasons to suspect the occult symbolism contained in these images, although, as none of them, Paul excepted perhaps, had been initiated, they could know nothing whatever about the nature of the final rites. Any person revealing these mysteries was put to death, regardless of sex, nationality, or creed. A Christian father would be no more proof against an accident than the pagan mista, or the word I don't know. If, during the apparata, or preliminary arcanes, there were some practices which might have shocked the pudicity of a Christian convert, though we doubt the sincerity of such statements. <clears throat> Their mystical symbolism was all sufficient to relieve the performance of any charge of licentiousness. Even the episode of the matron Bobo, whose rather eccentric method of consolation was immortalized in the minor mysteries, is explained by impartial mystagogues quite naturally. Ceres, Demeter, and her earthly wanderings in search of her daughter are the you humorized descriptions of one of the most metaphysico-psychological subjects ever treated of by the human mind. It is a mask for the transcendent narrative of the initiated seers, the celestial vision of the freed soul of the initiate of the last hour, describing the process by which the soul that has not, that has not yet been incarnated descends for the first time into matter. Blessed is he who hath seen these common concerns of the underworld. He knows both the end of life and its divine origin from Jupiter, says Pindar. Taylor shows, on the authority of more than one initiate, that the dramatic performances of the lesser mysteries were designed by their founders to signify occultly the condition of the unpurified soul invested with an earthly body and enveloped in a material and physical nature that the soul, indeed, till purified by philosophy, suffers death through its union with the body. 
The body is the sepulchre, the prison of the soul, and many Christian fathers held with Plato that the soul is punished through its union with the body. I am in complete disagreement with this. I do not believe that we are here as a prison. I believe that we are here on a voluntary existence. I have explained that in much more detail in other places, but I believe that every single one of us is here voluntarily and that all of the actions and the things that happen to us have been agreed to prior to incarnating. And so even the bad things have been agreed to. It is not a punishment. It is a lesson plan. We are here in school to learn something. And you can look at it as though we are on a prison planet. But doing so is a victim mentality and is not correct in my estimation. And I don't care how old that particular concept is. Such is the fundamental doctrine of the Buddhist and of many Brahmanists too. When Plotinus remarks that when the soul has descended into generation from its half divine condition, she partakes of evil and is carried a great way into a state of the opposite of her first purity and integrity, to be entirely merged in which is nothing more than a fall into a dark maya. He only repeats the teachings of Gautama Buddha. If we have to believe in the ancient initiates at all, we must accept their interpretation of the symbols. If, moreover, we find them perfectly coinciding with the teachings of the greatest philosophers, and that which we know symbolizes the same meaning in the modern mysteries in the East, we must believe them to be right. If Demeter was considered the intellectual soul, or rather the astral soul, half emanations from the spirit and half tainted with matter through a succession of spiritual evolutions, we may readily understand what is meant by the matron Balbo, the enchantress, who, before she succeeds in reconciling the soul, Demeter, to its new position, finds herself obliged to assume the sexual forms of an infant. Balbo is matter, the physical body, and the intellectual, as yet pure astral soul, can be ensnared into its new terrestrial prison, but by the display of innocent babyhood. That's wild. Until then, doomed to her fate, Demeter, or Magna Mater, the soul, wanders and hesitates and suffers. But once having partaken of the magic potion prepared by Balbo, she forgets her sorrows. For a certain time, she parts with that consciousness of higher intellect that she was possessed of before entering the body of a child. Therefore, thenceforth, she must seek to rejoin it again, and when the age of reason arrives for the child, the struggle, forgotten for a few years of infancy, begins again. The astral soul is placed between matter, body, and the highest intellect, its immortal spirit, or nous. Which of those two will conquer? The result of the battle of life lies between the triad. It is a question of a few years of physical enjoyment on earth and, if it has begotten abuse, of the dissolution of the earthly body being followed by death of the astral body, which, thus, is prevented from being united with the highest spirit of the triad, which alone confers on us individual immortality or, on the other hand, a becoming immortal misti, initiated before death of the body into the divine truths of the afterlife, demigods below and gods above. Such was the chief object of the mysteries, represented as diabolical by theology and ridiculed by modern symbologists. To disbelieve that there exist in man certain arcane powers, which, <clears throat> by psychological study, he can develop in himself to the highest degree, become an hierophant, and then impart to others under the same conditions of earthly discipline, is to cast an imputation of falsehood and lunacy upon a number of the best, purest, and most learned men of antiquity and of the Middle Ages. What the hierophant was allowed to see at the last hour is hardly hinted at by them, and yet, Pythagoras, Plato, Plotinus, Iamblichus, Proclus, and many others knew and affirmed their reality. Whether in the inner temple, or through the study of theurgy, carried on privately, or 
by the sole exertion of a whole life of spiritual labor, they all obtained the practical proof of such divine possibilities for man fighting his battle with life on earth to win a life in the eternity. What the last epoptia was is alluded to by Plato in Phaedrus. Being initiated in those mysteries, which it is lawful to call the most blessed of all mysteries, we were freed from the molestations of evils, which otherwise await us in the future period of time. Likewise, in consequence of this divine initiation, we became spectators of entire, simple, immovable, and blessed visions, resident in pure light. This sentence shows that they saw visions, gods, and spirits. As Taylor correctly observes, from all such passages in the works of the initiates, it may be inferred that the most sublime part of the apoptia, which consisted in beholding the gods themselves invested with the resplendent light, or highest planetary spirits. The statement of Proculus upon the subject is unequivocal. In all the initiations and mysteries, the gods exhibit many forms of themselves, and appear in a variety of shapes. Sometimes, indeed, a formless light of themselves is held forth to the view. Sometimes this light is according to a human form, and sometimes it proceeds into a different shape. Whatever is on earth in the, is the resemblance and shadow of something that is in the sphere, while the resplendent thing, the prototype of the soul spirit, remaineth in unchangeable condition. It is well also with its shadow. But when the resplendent one removeth far from its shadow, life removeth from the latter to a distance. And yet, that very light is the shadow of something still more resplendent than itself. Thus speaks Desatir, the Persian book of shit, thereby showing its identity of esoteric doctrines with those of the Greek philosophers. The second statement of Plato confirms our belief that the mysteries of the ancients were identical with the initiations, as practiced now among the Buddhist and the Hindu adepts. The highest visions, the most truthful, are produced not through natural ecstatics or mediums, as it is sometimes erroneously asserted, but through a regular discipline of gradual initiations and development of psychical powers. The mystai were brought into close union with those whom Proclus called mystical natures, resplendent gods, because, as Plato says, we were ourselves pure and immaculate, being liberated from this surrounding vestment, which we denominate body, and to which we are now bound like an oyster to its shell. So the doctrine of planetary and terrestrial Petrus was revealed entirely in ancient India, as well as now, only at the last moment of initiation and to the adepts of superior degrees. Many are the fakirs who, though pure and honest and self-devoted, have yet never seen the astral form of a purely human petar, or ancestor or father, otherwise than at the solemn moment of their first and last initiation. It is in the presence of his instructor, the guru, and just before the Vatau Vakir is dispatched into the world of the living, with his seven-knotted bamboo wand for all protection, that he is suddenly placed face to face with the unknown presence. He sees it and falls prostrate at the feet of the evanescent form but it is not entrusted with the great secret of its evocation, for it is the supreme mystery of the holy syllable. The Aum contains the evocation of the Vedic triad, the Trimurti Brahma, Vishnu, Siva, says the Orientalist. It contains the evocation of something more real and objective than this triune abstraction. We say, respectfully contradicting the eminent scientists, it is the trinity of man himself on his way to become immortal through the solemn union of his inner triune self, the exterior, gross body, the husk not even being taken into consideration in this human trinity. It is when this, when this trinity, in anticipation of the final triumphant reunion beyond the gates of corporeal death, 
became, for a few seconds, a unity that the candidate is allowed at the moment of the initiation to behold his future self. Thus we read in the Persian Desatir of the Resplendent One, in the Greek philosopher initiates of the Augurides, the self-shining blessed vision resident in the pure light, in Porphyry, that Plotinus was united with his God six times during his lifetime, and so on. <clears throat> in ancient India, the mystery of the triad known but to the initiates could not, under the penalty of death, be revealed to the vulgar, says Vrihaspati. Neither could it in the ancient Grecian and Samothracian mysteries, nor can it be now. <laughs> it is in the hands of the adepts and must remain a mystery to the world so long as the materialistic savant regards it as an undemonstrated fallacy, an insane hallucination, and the dogmatic theologian, the snare of the evil one. Subjective communication with the human, godlike spirits of those who have preceded us to the silent land of bliss is in India divided into three categories. Under the spiritual training of a guru, or sannyasi, the vatu, disciple or neophyte, begins to feel them. Were he not under the immediate guidance of an adept, he would be controlled by the invisibles and utterly at their mercy. For among these subjective influences, he is unable to discern the good from the bad. Happy the sensitive, who is sure of the purity of his spiritual atmosphere. To this subjective consciousness, which is the first degree, is, after a time, added that of clairaudience. This is the second degree or stage of development. The sensitive, when not naturally made so by psychological training, now audibly hears, but is still unable to discern and is incapable of verifying his impressions. And one who is unprotected, the tricky powers of the air, but too often delude with semblance of voices and speech. But the guru's influence is there. It is the most powerful shield against the intrusion of the Bhutana in the atmosphere of the Vatu, consecrated to the pure human and celestial Pitris. The third degree is that when the fakir or any other candidate both feels, hears, and sees, and when he can, at will, produce the reflections of the Pitris on the mirror of astral light. All depends on his psychological and mesmeric powers, which are always proportionate to the intensity of his will. But the fakir will never control the akasa, the spiritual life principle, the omnipotent agent of every phenomenon, in the same degree as an adept of the third and highest initiation, and the phenomena produced by the will of the latter do not generally run the marketplaces for the satisfaction of open-mouthed investigators. <clears throat> The unity of God, the immortality of the spirit, belief in salvation only through our works, merit and demerit, are such are the principal articles of faith of the wisdom religion and the groundwork of Vedaism, Buddhism, Parsism, and such we find to have been even that of the ancient Osirism, when we, after abandoning the popular sun god to the materialism of the rabble, confine our attention to the books of Hermes, the thrice great. The thought concealed as yet the word in science, silence and darkness, then the Lord who exists through himself and who is not to be divulged to the external senses of man, dissipated darkness and manifested the perceptible world. He that can be perceived only by the spirit that escapes the organs of sense who is without visible parts eternal, the soul of all beings that none can comprehend, displayed his own splendor. Manu, Book 1, Slokas 6 and 7. Such is the ideal of the Supreme in the mind of every Hindu philosopher. Of all duties, the principal one is to acquire the knowledge of the Supreme Soul, the Spirit. It is the first of all sciences, for it alone confers on man immortality. Manu, Book 12, Sloka 85. And our scientists talk of the nirvana of Buddha and the moksha of Brahma as of a complete annihilation. It is thus that the following verse is interpreted by some materialists. 
the man who recognizes the supreme soul in his own soul, as well as in that of the, all the creatures, and who is equally just to all, whether man or animals, obtains the happiest of all fates, that, to be finally absorbed in the bosom of Brano, Brahma, Manu, Book 12, Sloka 125. The doctrine of the moksha and the nirvana, as understood by the school of Max Muller, can never bear confronting with numerous texts that can be found, if required, as a final refutation. There are sculptures in many pagodas which contradict, point blank, the imputation. Ask a Brahmin to explain moksha, address yourself to an educated Buddhist, and pray him to define for you the meaning of nirvana. Both will answer you that in every one of these religions, nirvana represents the dogma of the spirit's immortality. That, to reach the nirvana means absorption into the great universal soul, the latter representing a state not an individual being or an anthropomorphic god, as some understand the great existence, that a spirit reaching such a state becomes a part of the integral whole, but never loses its individuality for all that. Henceforth, the spirit lives spiritually, without any fear of further modification of form. For form pertains to matter, and the state of nirvana implies a complete purification or a final riddance from even the most sublimated particle of matter. This word, absorbed, when it is proved that the Hindus and Buddhists believe in the immortality of the spirit, must necessarily mean intimate union, not annihilation. Let Christians call them idolaters, if they still dare to do so, in the face of science and the latest translations, uh, translations of the sacred Sanskrit books. They have no right to present the speculative philosophy of ancient sages with as an inconsistency, and the philosophers themselves as illogical fools. With far better reason, we can accuse the ancient Jews of utter nihilism. There is not a word contained in the book of books of Moses, or the prophets either, which, taken literally, implies the spirit's immortality. Yet, every devout Jew hopes as well to be gathered into the bosom of a Brahman. The Hierophants and some Brahmins are accused of having administered to their epopti strong drinks or anesthetics to produce visions which shall be taken by the latter as realities. They did and do use sacred beverages which, like the Soma drink, possess the faculty of freeing the astral form from the bonds of matter, but in those visions there is as little to be attributed to hallucination as in the glimpses which the scientist, with the help of his optical instrument, gets into the microscopic world. A man cannot perceive, touch, and converse with pure spirit through any of his bodily senses. Only spirit alone can talk to and see spirit, and even our astral soul, the doppelganger, is too gross, too much tainted yet with earthly matter to trust entirely to its perceptions and insinuations. How dangerous may often become untrained mediumship, and how thoroughly it was understood and provided against by the ancient sages is perfectly exemplified in the case of Socrates. <clears throat> the old Grecian philosopher was a medium, hence he had never been initiated into the mysteries, for such was the rigorous law. But he had his familiar spirit, as they call it, his diomenion, and this invisible counselor became the cause of his death. That is not true. It is generally believed that if he was not initiated into the mysteries, it was because he himself neglected to become so. But the secret records teach us that it was because he could not be admitted to permit, participate in the sacred rites, and precisely, as we state, on account of his mediumship. There was a law against the admission not only of such as were convicted of deliberate witchcraft, but even of those who were known to have a familiar spirit. The law was just and logical because a genuine medium is more or less irresponsible and the eccentricities of Socrates are thus accounted for in some degree. A medium must be passive, and if a firm believer in his spirit guide, he will allow himself to be ruled by the latter, not by the rules of the sanctuary. 
a medium of olden times, like the modern medium, was subject to be entranced at the will and pleasure of the power which controlled him. Therefore, he could not well have been entrusted with the awful secrets of the final initiation, never to be revealed under the penalty of death. The old sage, in unguarded moments of spiritual inspiration, revealed that which he had never learned, and was therefore put to death as an atheist. That is not what happened. <laughs> right? If you want to know what happened with Socrates, we have covered that. It's in the Ancient Lore playlist. It is in the writings of Plato. How then, with such an instance as that of Socrates, in relation to the visions and spiritual wonders of the epopti of the inner temple, can anyone assert that these seers, theurgists, and thaumaturgists were all spirit mediums? Neither Pythagoras, Plato, nor any of the more important Neoplatonists, neither Iamblichus, Lagenius, Proclus, nor Apollyonus of Tyana were ever mediums, for in such case they would not have been admitted to the mystery at all. As Taylor proves, this assertion of divine visions and the mysteries is clearly confirmed by Plotinus, and in short, that magical evocation formed a part of the sacerdotal office in them, and that this was universally believed by all antiquity long before the era of the latter Platonist, shows that apart from natural mediumship, there has existed, from the beginning of time, a mysterious science discussed by many but known only to a few. The use of it is a longing towards our only true and real home, the afterlife, and a desire to cling more closely to our parent spirit because of its sorcery, witchcraft, black magic. Abuse of it is sorcery, witchcraft, and black magic. Between the two is placed natural mediumship, a soul clothed with imperfect matter a ready agent for either one or the other, and utterly dependent on its surroundings of life, constitutional heredity, physical as well as mental, and on the nature of the spirits it attracts around itself, a blessing or a curse as fate will have it unless the medium is purified of earthly dross. The reason why in every age so little has been generally known of the mysteries of initiation is twofold. The first has already been explained by more than one author, and lies in the terrible penalty following the least indiscretion. The second is the superhuman difficulties and even dangers which the daring candidate of old had to encounter and either conquer or die in the attempt when, what is still worse, he did not lose his reason. There is no danger to him whose mind had become thoroughly spiritualized and so prepared for every terrific sight. He, who fully recognized the power of his immortal spirit and never doubted for one moment its omnipotent protection, had naught to fear. But woe to the candidate in whom the slightest physical fear, sickly child of matter, laid, made him lose sight and faith in his own invulnerability. He, who was not wholly confident of his moral fitness to accept the burden of these tremendous secrets, was doomed. The Talmud gives the story of the four Tanaim, who are made, in allegorical terms, to enter into the Garden of Delights, in example, to be initiated into the occult and final science. According to the teachings of our Holy Masters, the names of the four who entered the Garden of Delight are... Ben Asai, Ben Zoma, Archer, and Rabbi Akiba. Ben Asai looked and lost his sight. Ben Zoma looked and lost his reason. Archer made depredations in the plantation, mixed up the hole and failed. But Akiba, who had entered in peace, came out of it in peace, for the saint whose name be blessed had said, This old man is worthy of serving us with glory. The learned commentators on the Talmud, the rabbis of the synagogue, explain that the Garden of Delight, in which these four personages were made to enter, is but that mysterious science, the most terrible of sciences for weak intellects, which it leads directly to insanity, says a Franck in his Kabbala. It is not the pure of heart and he who studies, but with a view of perfecting himself, and so more easily acquiring the promised immortality, who need have any fear, but rather 
he who makes of the science of sciences a sinful pretext for worldly motives, who should tremble. The latter will never withstand the Kabbalistic evocations of the supreme initiation. The licentious performances of the thousand and one early Christian sects may be criticized by partial commentators as well as the ancient Eleusinian and other rites. But why should they incur the blame of the theologians, the Christians, when their own mysteries of the divine incarnation with Joseph, Mary, and the angel in a sacred trilogue used to be enacted in more than one country and were famous at one time in Spain and southern France. Later, they fell, like many of the other once secret rites, into the hands of the populace. It is but a few years since, during every Christmas week, punch and duty boxes containing the above-named personages and additional display of the infant Jesus and his manger were carried about the country in Poland and southern Russia. They were called Kalai Devuki, a word, the correct etymology of which we are unable to give unless it is from the verb Kaliadovat, a word that we as willingly abandon to learn philologists. We have seen this show in our days of childhood. We remember the three king Magi represented by three dolls in powdered wigs and colored tights. It is from recollecting the simple, profound veneration depicted on the faces of the pious audience that we can the more readily appreciate the honest and just remark by the editor in the introduction to the Eleusinian Mysteries, who says, It is ignorance which leads to profanation. Men ridicule what they do not properly understand. The undercurrent of this world is set towards one goal, and inside of human credulity call it human weakness if you please, is a power almost infinite, a holy faith capable of apprehending the supremest truths of all existence. If that abstract sentiment, called Christian charity, prevailed in the church, we would be well content to leave all this unsaid. We have no quarrel with Christians whose faith is sincere and who practice coincides with their profession. But with an ignorant, arrogant, dogmatic, and dishonest clergy, we have nothing to do except see the ancient philosophy, antagonized by modern theology and its puny offspring, spiritualism, defended and righted so far as we are able, so that its grandeur and sufficiency may be thoroughly displayed. It is not alone for the esoteric philosophy that we fight, nor for any modern system of moral philosophy, but for the inalienable right of private judgment, and especially for the ennobling idea of a future life of activity and accountability. We eagerly applaud such commentators as Godfrey Higgins, Inman, Payne Knight, King, Dunlap, and Dr. Newton, however much they disagree with our own mystical views. <clears throat> For their diligence is constantly being rewarded by fresh discoveries of the pagan paternity of Christian symbols. But otherwise, all these learned works are useless. Their researches only cover half the ground, lacking the true key of interpretation. They see the symbols only in the physical aspect. They have no password to cause the gates of mystery to swing open. And ancient spiritual philosophy is to them a closed book diametrically opposed, though they be, to the clergy in their ideas respecting it. In the way of interpretation, they do little more than their opponents for a questioning public. Their labors tend to strengthen materialism as those of the clergy, especially the Romish clergy, do to cultivate belief in diabolism. If the study of hermetic philosophy held out no other hope of reward, it would be more than enough to know that by it we may learn what, with what perfection of justice the world is governed. <clears throat> a sermon upon this text is preached by every page of history. Among all, there is not one that conveys a deeper moral than the case of the Roman Church. The divine law of compensation was never more strikingly exemplified than in the fact that by her own act, she has deprived herself of the only possible key to her own religious mysteries. 
the assumption of Godfrey Higgins that there are two doctrines maintained in the Roman Church, one for the masses and the other, the esoteric, for the perfect or the initiates, as in the ancient mysteries, appears to us unwarranted and rather fantastic. They have lost the key, we repeat. Otherwise, no terrestrial power could have prostrated her and accept a superficial knowledge of the means of producing miracles. Her clergy can in no way be compared in their wisdom with the hierophants of old. <clears throat> in burning the work of the theurgist, in prescribing those who affect their study, in affixing the stigma of demonolatry to magic in general, Rome has left her exoteric worship and Bible to be helplessly riddled by every free thinker, her sexual emblems to be identified with coarseness, and her priest to unwittingly turn magicians and even sorcerers in their exorcisms, which are but necromantic evocations. Thus, retribution, by the exquisite adjustment of divine law, is made to overtake this scheme of cruelty, injustice, and bigotry through her own suicidal acts. True philosophy and divine truth are con convertible terms. A religion which dreads the light cannot be a religion based on either truth or philosophy. Hence, it must be false. The ancient mysteries were mysteries to the profane only, whom the Hierophant never sought nor would accept as proselytes. To the initiates, the mysteries became explained as soon as the final veil was withdrawn. No mind like that of Pythagoras or Plato would have contented itself with an unfathomable and incomprehensible mystery like that of the Christian dogma. There can be but one truth, for two small truths on the same subject can but constitute one great error. Among thousands of exoteric or popular conflicting religions which have been propagated since the days when the first men were enabled to interchange their ideas, not a nation, not a people, nor the most abject tribe, but after their own fashion has believed in an unseen God, the first cause of unerring and immutable laws, and in the immortality of our spirit. No creed, no false philosophy, no religious exaggerations could ever destroy that feeling. It must, therefore, be based upon an absolute truth. On the other hand, every one of the numberless religions and religious sects view the deity after its own fashion, and, fathering on the unknown its own speculations, it enforces these purely human outgrowths of overheated imagination on the ignorant masses and calls them revelation. As the dogmas of every religion and sect often differ radically, they cannot be true. And if untrue, what are they? The greatest curse to a nation, remarks Dr. Inman, is not a bad religion, but a form of faith which prevents manly inquiry. I know of no nation of old that was priest-ridden, which did not fall under the swords of those who did not care for hierarchs. The greatest danger is to be feared from the ecclesiastics who wink at vice and encourage it as a means whereby they can gain power over their votaries. As if so long as every man does to other men as he would, that they should do to him, and allows no one to interfere between him and his maker, all will go well with the world. And thus ends part two, or part two, chapter two, part two. Hopefully I brought a little bit of enlightenment and not too much confusion to a somewhat difficult series of topics. I understand that I hold some unconventional beliefs and I have a tendency to step on toes when I relay those. It is not intentional, but I do not apologize for it. Again, there was not a whole lot for me to add other than the fact that there was a complete misrepresentation of both Socrates and his demon. And I'm unsure whether that would have held him out of the mysteries, even with the explanations that we have been given. He did, in fact, believe that he had a demon that talked to him, but that demon guided him correctly all through his life, and it was by not stopping him from going to his death that it could be blamed for his death but that is a gross misrepresentation of the man choosing to die for truth that was an important step in human history it is an important example to be looked upon and should not be dismissed in the way that it was in this particular study 
Once again, I have covered that in the Ancient Lore playlist. There's a separate list for Plato, but it's a lot harder for me to find. Even though it's my playlist, it's harder for me to link than the Ancient Lore one. So it is in the Ancient Lore playlist. <clears throat> Several of the things that are discussed here we have already dealt with, right? Nirvana being the reunification with the One, being one of those. It is not an annihilation, it is a reabsorption, and it is something that you can in at least a little bit experience, because I have. When I had my spiritual existence experience, it was literally what is being described as nirvana in real terms. It was the reunification with spirit, and then I got to see the creation of the universe, and I got inducted into the Order of Melchizedek, which I am a member of, and shown things that were simply true. We have talked about those in extensive detail, so we're not going to again here, but it is available on the Infinite Integrations and probably the Ancient Lore playlist as well. Most of the works of Plato, right, uh, had a lot of exposition in them that we talked about a lot of things. It is a really good place to get a good, firm foundation for what we do here is in the works of Plato. And so, we're going to go ahead and wrap this one up. Hopefully, I brought a little bit of enlightenment and not too much confusion. If you like what I'm doing over here, let me know down below. Give me a like, share, and a sub. Throw me a comment. Let me know if you agree or disagree. If it remains respectful, it gets to remain up. If there is another work you would like to see me work through in the way that we are doing here, drop that in the comments as well. And if you really like what we're doing, hit us with that super thanks to the crew. Thanks for hanging out. I appreciate every single minute that you are here with me, and I am praying for you every single day. Until next time, I love you. God loves you. You are perfect, whole, and complete just the way that you are. And this has been Pitt's Take. Peace.